assess whether this person still needs to be on bail. Okay. okay. Well, thank you, Elsie. You're welcome. So thank you, uh, Zuki Swa. The slides are up. Uh, can we see them? Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. All yes. right. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let yes, us, okay. thank you so much. Let us uh, move. Uh, I believe we have really done a lot. We can't finish everything as we say, but we have to make sure that we touch on every other important aspect. So we are moving to another leg of uh, this uh, chap uh, topic on criminal practice. court practice is the methods of disposing of the case. So how do we get the case to be disposed of? One, we can try uh, the process that is known as representations. These representations are your submissions that are going to be made formally or informally to the, uh, the members of the prosecution. You can even start this process in court with the prosecutor in your court. And basically you do an informal discussion about your case and you say to them look um i'm seeing that when this matter goes forward to trial you are going to maybe have a challenge to prove this issue or that issue and uh, um you know i'm i'm submitting that you should actually consider a withdrawal of the charges or sometimes you may be asking for the what is known as diversion so here you are saying to the prosecutor that your client is not entirely innocent of the charges that they've been leveled against them. And you are saying to them, the, the accused is not going to plead guilty, but they are going to accept responsibility for the commission of the offense. And you are going to ask the state not to uh, make the accused to enter a plea of guilty because of uh, the reasons that you will say, for instance, maybe the accused is someone who is a, a drug addict, and you will then explain that due to the fact that they are... Uh, who's this on camera? Please close your video. Glenn Van Royen, please uh, close your video, please. Switch off your thank you. So you are going to say uh, maybe there's a substance abuse a problem, alcohol, drugs, uh, and you may say, for instance, it's a charge of either housebreaking and this accused, it doesn't necessarily have to be a child or a teenager. It can also be a grown up. So you can say the reason why the accused has uh, involved themselves with criminal activities is to feed, for instance, the, the drug habit. So normally they break into people's houses, which is not right, as we all know. And uh, But the, the motivation for them to continue doing what they do, it's because they need to feed this uh, drug habit that they have. And... Maybe there will be also some family members at court who are going to give you the history of the accused and tell you that, you know, my son was a very good boy, you know, he did so well at school, you know, until maybe at some stage in life, something went wrong and wrong company. And they will tell you, you know, he was such an ambitious young man who had a great potential. So, you know, if only they could kick the drug, the drug uh, habit, you know, they could maybe still possibly turn around their life. And you are basically asking the state to give this person a second chance to mend their ways and, and correct, you know, their mistakes and, and actually learn, obviously, from their mistakes. Maybe they can also be put through some programs. It can be life skills. It can be anger management whatever programs that uh, will be offered by your organizations like Sanka or a rehabilitation center. And you say to the state that this person shouldn't, you know, be given uh, or be made to plead guilty because you, as you are well aware, 
with a guilty plea, they are going to have a previous conviction. So you are avoiding them ending up with that convic uh, uh, a previous conviction, but they must still learn uh, that you know, for what they have done, they must still be corrected without you know having them uh, ending up with a criminal uh, record. So you can maybe then make those submissions and then social workers can also be uh, contacted to also participate in this process in order to do some background uh, work and maybe visit the family of the accused and gather all the information that can be of, of assistance to the court to also see that uh, this person is someone that uh, really is in need of help. So should you then uh, have this, uh, those reports, then you can present them also to the state and say, you know, and even you can even ask the accused uh, for those maybe who are already on bail through their family to say, you know, start going, or maybe they have a history that they've been going to this uh, Sanka and those type of organizations. But there may be an issue that maybe they were defaulting. So maybe you may need to have a sit down with your client and explain to them that, look, this time it may be your last chance, you know, to avoid uh, being uh, having a criminal, a, con a, a criminal record. So please, if you were uh, already someone who was attending some programs, you know, please go back there, continue the sessions. And then when you are making that uh, representations to the state that uh, the accused should be considered for this diversion, then you can also mention that from their own initiative, they are not being compelled, you know, by a court uh, order. They are doing it on their own because they also show the initiative that they would want to change. So you can also do that. And... Uh, for those severe cases of drug abuse, especially that are involving uh, younger people, then you would actually use the court to, you would have, for instance, the parent, you know, or a guardian of that uh, accused to come and actually testify in court and inform the court of what they are going through at the hands of the accused for them uh, abusing the substance that they are abusing. And, you know, because uh, in mostly such cases of uh, substance abuse, it doesn't only affect the user and the family would also give, you know, instances of how they've been uh, also affected by the accused uh, wanting to continue feeding their habit, maybe they assault their parent or they are stealing from them, you know. So then the mother maybe may say that I've also tried to take this child there myself, but I can't always control them because, you know, they disappear sometimes when they are going to smoke. And now I'm, you know, I'm at, at the court asking the court to help me to ensure that they will be placed in a rehabilitation center, uh, maybe for a period that can be six to maybe 12 months at under a court order. And, you know, that will somehow help them to stay focused on uh, and follow through to a rehabilitation program. So that can also be done. So you can also use a uh, mediation uh, where you or uh, you are going to t have all the parties that are involved being uh, in court and you can all sit together with uh, the parties between yourself as the state and the defense discuss about the incident and this would happen mostly in cases of domestic violence obviously the state would be concerned about the severity of uh, things like violence that is involved. If there's, a, you know, very minimal 
a, a, a violence that maybe not even is is not too much uh, rife. That when maybe it's just a matter of the accused, they tend to fight. You know, uh, they'll just get into verbal arguments and. Yeah, there'll just be some screaming, shouting, and swearing that would normally happen. Those kind of cases, there may be a, even a protection order that is involved, but you can mediate to say, you know, maybe they, they just need to, an accused maybe needs to attend some life skills, you know, programs, and then you mediate with the state that, um, you know, they, 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 the accused should actually maybe go through some therapy or whatever sessions that would help them. But please be warned that uh, when you do make these representations, I did tell you that the prosecutors are dominus litis. So the final decision to either proceed or grant you any of the requests that I have made uh, or suggestions for withdrawal, diversion, mediation, whatever, or even even a plea bargaining, it's ultimately up to them to decide. Even if uh, the complainant comes forward and they say, I want to withdraw the case. I don't want to proceed. I've forgiven this person. The final decision to prosecute the matter is still resting on the state prosecutor. It happens a lot that you will see that the complainants may even write, a, what is they, they call it a withdrawal statement where they will express that in, you know, their they're, they're, they're they're, intentions not to proceed with the case. And that in that statement will be brought to court. The prosecutors will still subpoena that witness to come and they will interview them further to want to know, you know, especially with a, a bit one of those more uh, serious offenses or where there's also elements of violence that are involved. So they would want to be satisfied that before they can take, you know, they're very careful to not withdraw generally cases that involve violence or where there's those standing protection orders that's been granted. Because remember, even if you can say I forgive the accused, the protection order does not rot. It is for life, unless if another court can come and change that uh, there's, there'll be a variation or there'll be a rescission of that order or whatever later application that can be made to change that court order. For as long as it, it's been given by the court, it is forever, no matter how many times you may forgive each other. Anytime uh, the accused is going to do something that is contrary to the order, it remains a violation of that court order. So... I know that it becomes quite frustrating when you have a complainant who has no interest in proceeding and you, you know, they tell you that, look, family has got, uh, they've come together, we've resolved the issue, but the state would say no. Sorry, why? Because we know in our country, uh, you know, gender-based violence is a very serious problem. So, in fact, most prosecutors don't even want to be the one who would put their stamp and signature to say withdraw. Like it, they are seemingly afraid to even be the one to endorse that the matter should be withdrawn because there are cases where they have previously withdrawn cases and the victims would turn out to have been killed by the same partner, you know. So that is why we also need to be Consider it not to say we agree with them. Obviously, we are going to try and do the mediation, but uh, I'm just trying to say understand where they're coming from when they are not going to be easily swayed to uh, withdraw those kind of cases. But it doesn't mean they don't withdraw them at all. They do really try and 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 interview their witnesses and and show them of the danger, you know, that they may be uh, putting themselves you know, to under if they don't proceed with the cases. And yeah, sometimes then the state would actually say, no, proceed. And then you are entering a trial. They call the witness. They will tell them that, no, once you went to, to the police to report, the matter is no longer in your hands. They tell that to the complainant. 
and they will tell them, you've given a statement to the police that, you know, has made this uh, case to come before court. And that statement was made under oath. So we are proceeding with the case and they will call the witness, put them in the stand. They will talk about what happened. And some way, somehow, obviously you are privy to the fact that actually that witness did not want to proceed. So you will then have to see how you can put uh, put that information now to be uh, known also to the presiding officer. But it doesn't make a guarantee that that accused will not be found guilty. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Does this does this also apply to cases where a victim opened a case against um, someone because they were sexually assaulted, but they decided to drop the charges later on? Let's say, for instance, after two months, um, and investigations were still. Does does it ever happen like? You've cut off um, like the victim dropped the. Victim. The charges, yes. So, well, what happens in that case? Does it always show for the accused that there was a case opened against them at a certain year or any? Yes, the police have a, a profile that they keep for every arrested person. Whether the case will end up with a conviction, they have a record of all the cases that were withdrawn even before they reached court or any other case that has ever been opened in, I mean, against that particular accused, they will have a record. If anywhere in the country, it may be different places, uh, different years, they will have that record. May I see? Yes. Uh, Gilbert Pisani Kimberley. Yes. Uh, I, just, I just want to check something with you. I understand the process of mediation. I understood it perfectly. Mm. And uh, when we take the same uh, scenario or example that you have just shared with us of domestic violence, mm. when the matter is brought to the police before mm. it could be brought to the attention of the court, does the police have any right or power to also play a role of mediation as and when there's a, there's a case of this nature? It is highly discouraged because of past experiences, because uh, normally a complainant, uh, they would, you remember people used to say, I went to the police to report an incident and the police told me that it's a domestic issue, Let me, I must go home and resolve it. So I, I would like to believe that members of the South African police are not going to entertain such kind of mediations. They would you just take the report and if the parties approach the police and say we want to mediate they would then uh, direct them to the prosecutors but it doesn't mean that they don't get approached like i i told you the withdrawal statements are made to the investigating officers so they will go to the investigating officer and tell them i want to make a withdrawal statement and they and obviously it's their job to get all the witness statements. So they will write it for them and they will put it in the docket. When it goes to court, then the prosecutors will be made aware that this is what the witness is saying. So then they will then call that witness to, to come and hear more. Why are they uh, making such a statement when initially they opened the case? Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Elsie. Yeah. In the event that the complainant has been granted a protection order against the accused, but the very same complainant is the one who is going back to the accused to provoke, um, can a counter protection order uh, be granted to the accused against the complainant? Uh, counter protection charges happen all the time. So in the same manner, when that protection order was applied for the first time, the matter will go before the family court and it, then there will be a presiding officer who will then call for the evidence of the parties to now decide whether uh, this one who's coming now to 
apply as a new complainant. It will be a new application now that are they warranted to be given a protection order also. So it happens that both the accused and the complainant can have protection orders granted against each other. That right. also happens. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay. It's it's a mess actually. <laughs> With these protection orders, I I just have to say that uh, yes, we understand the reasoning why they've they've been uh, there was that process created for people to be able to get protection. But also, you know, with any system, there's also an abuse. So uh, people use that process also to settle other scores, which are not even uh, about domestic violence per se. Like, as we know, you would often find with those protection orders, many times the people are complaining that they want that person out of the house. Maybe they're not able to live cordially in the same dwelling. So when they want the person out, who evict a person by law, it's a very long process. So people would then rush to that process and get those protection orders. And obvious, once there is an interim protection order, the court will then make those uh, you know, order that the person cannot stay in that place anymore. So that is often also, I'm not saying it's right, but people, they use that also to get people kicked out of their places of uh, accommodation, where they stay. So just be uh, aware. I, I would want to, I want to chip in something, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Protection order or interim protection order made final, it's not an eviction order. No, I'll it's say. not. But if a person yes. does something that is contrary to what is in that protection order, the state yes. can charge that person for violating yes. an interim order. An interim order is still an order of court. Yes. Mm. You see, that is so the problem. It will be up, up, up to that person to decide whether. Uh, the living condition now, it's uh, good for him or her to continue to live in that place. Mm. So the best thing to advise yeah. them is find alternative accommodation so that be until the day they can go for the final uh, hearing where the court will make a final uh, you know, pronouncement whether it's, it's making that interim order into a final order. At least there will not be any contact and any other issues that would have come in between there that would make the court to make that order final. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Indemnity is the next method that uh, we discuss. So section 204 of the criminal procedure says that a witness is immune from prosecution if they cooperate with the state. So basically here you have a, an, an accused who is, um, is, is charged with uh, others. So there's more than one accused involved in a matter and they may give evidence against their co-accused or give evidence to the police that is going to, ask, to assist the state to secure a prosecution. Then the court, I mean, the state will then choose to take that person not as an accused person anymore. And they would, first of all, they will want that person to actually testify to that information. And if they are satisfied with how that person has testified, then they eventually withdraw the charges against that person. So now, please, uh, I say there that you should note that where in the proceedings where the case uh, or their case is against uh, other accused, the state cannot solely rely on the evidence of this co accused to prosecute uh, the others. 
the state should have other evidence that is going to link the accused persons to the commission of the crime. So it will help the state to also have maybe fingerprints or maybe DNA or whatever, whatever other evidence that they, it's not going to be only because of this information of a co-accused that they will now uh, rely only on that to, or to get a conviction. If that is their only uh, strongest form of evidence, then it will be attacked, obviously, because you know the defense there will accuse that co-accused of possibly lying against their co-accused to save themselves. And it's a different situation if this was just a person who was picked up by the state themselves and they used them as a state witness from the outset. But for this accused to be an accused person, it means that the state had a reason to believe that they were also involved in the commission of the crime. So they could be trying to, you know, save their neck at the expense of their co-accused. That is why, you know, the court would want something else independent of that. Uh, of course, the court will rely on what this uh, 204 witness is going to say, but it will also want corroboration from another type of evidence. Admission of guilt of fine is very popular because it was seen to be an easy way to... Uh, may I please ask a question before we, you take the next uh, uh, topic? Yes. Yeah, I just want to check with regard to, to uh, section 204. Mm. Uh, your line is cutting. I, uh, I, uh, yes, I, I, don't, I don't have uh, the perfect network here. I'm struggling. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Yeah, I just want to check that uh, when you talk about uh, are you are going to cooperate with the state, does that involve uh, the, the main accused? Or only the yeah, Alpheus, your line is cutting you, but I, I think don't know if you, you got me. can uh, he maybe can he maybe type maybe in the type question? it in? Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe type it yeah, in. No. But I think if you are saying, can a 204 witness be a main accused or can it only be co-accused? It can be any accused, whether it's accused number one or accused number four. It can be anyone who can help the state with their case to prosecute the case against their fellow accused. So it can also be a main accused if that's uh, what you were asking. Okay. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this admission of guilt, we, we know it because it's, it's often been referred, used where you are dealing with those uh, lesser, less serious offenses. And because the whole process of an admission of guilt fine, it's, it doesn't happen in a court in front of a deciding officer. It was uh, made out or people thought, and I don't know who to blame there, that uh, it not, it is not uh, as serious as a guilty plea. So, People would often jump to uh, 
Okay. I think the person will read, will, will get the recording. So where, for instance, uh, the, 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 the accused would be advised to pay an admission of guilt because this process does not happen in front of a magistrate. Uh, it was thought that it's not like a, when a person is pleading guilty before a presiding officer. So a lot of times people do not actually know when they pay an, a, an admission of guilt fine that the, the effect of doing so is actually the same as, as, as uh, being found guilty because you are actually going to be having a, a, a criminal record by paying that a uh, small amount of money which you were told that it will make the the whole case to go away so this uh, admission of guilt fine is fixed by a prosecutor normally in their offices and also the clerk of the court they do have some forms that you will uh, hand over complete and hand over to them once everything is being agreed between the accused and the prosecutor, and the payment of that admission of guilt will happen at the leg of the court. So it was just a matter of completing some forms and then paying a small amount of money, like, you know, 300 rand. So then a, a lot of people were finding themselves in that situation where they've paid those fines, but later on, maybe they are seeking employment then, or maybe they are actually arrested for something else, it comes up. So the implications are that uh, you can have a criminal record after you've paid such a fine. And the only way to get that criminal record removed is to challenge it through getting it to be expunged from your record. So please, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we should not be lightly advising clients to jump into entering into this type of admission of guilt unless they have been fully advised of the implications that follow from uh, doing that because uh, when a person has actually paid that fine, their fingerprints will be taken at court and they will be sent to the criminal record center. And that's where the record of this criminal record is going to be reflecting against them. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, I, just, I have a question. No? Yes. Um, one of the concerns we, we have in South Africa is the question of... Uh, uh, corruption. Now, I just want to check to what extent is the complainant involved in that process when uh, an accused and maybe the prosecutor decide that um, uh, maybe this person would have uh, pleaded or confirmed that they've done one, two, three, and they want to escape from uh, going through trial uh, and everything else. To what extent are complainants involved so that uh, there's also balance of justice uh, from the other side? Because one would might say that uh, some of these cases are thrown because of these brown envelopes if certain things are not explained properly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you are right to say that uh, I'm not going to say it's always because of corruption. I don't know. But uh, I know of cases where these admission of guilt fine discussions would happen between the state and the accused without the involvement of the uh, complainants. So only if a complainant comes forward and says, you know, the, how the matter was handled, there was involvement of corruption, then you know if you are making an allegation, there must be some proofs thereof. And if you were not actually there 
to have seen that brown envelope exchanging hands and actually seeing the contents of that brown envelope. Unfortunately for that compl uh, that complainant, it, it, it actually, you know, ends up being something that ends up in the air because of lack of evidence, you see. So I'm not yeah, saying Mama, it I just happen. want to ask. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to ask a question with regards, with regards to the issue of uh, pleading guilty. Say, for instance, we have an illiterate client who have already uh, pleaded this guilty and pay admission of fine. You know? And later on, uh, the person have consulted or now consult us and stuff. So we find out that this person have paid an admission of guilt. So what do we now do? How do we challenge this kind of uh, 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 problem? Because this person have already paid but admission even, of guilt. If, even if they are illiterate, they will know that there was a criminal offense that they had against them. And there was an offer that if they didn't want to actually go through a trial, they could pay a fine. An illiterate person understands that. Unless if he says that they yeah, didn't... But we have a... Hmm? We have a situation where people who really don't want to even stay second in jail, you know, and the police will approach them and say, you know what, pay admission of guilt and you can get out of here. You know, if the situation happened like that, what do you do? Yes, as that's a, what I'm saying, that they would know that there was a criminal offense that is involved and they would know that there was a payment of money. So if they cannot read the forms that are... Uh, they are signing and them somebody would have explained to them that okay these forms uh, they are completing it's for this and then they would actually go and pay the money from their pocket at the clerk of the court so they i don't know how you would want to say that they didn't know what they were doing but the issue of uh, this fine being paid it's to get it off the record. The best way that I know of is uh, through the expungement. Uh, Ma'am. Mm, right. Yes. Loyalty. Yes. How, how effective are traffic fines in this regard? No. Remember, I said when the, the one that I'm referring to here, it's the one that happens at court where after those forms they will take fingerprints and those fingerprints if that is done those are the ones that would reflect i don't know of anyone who was never taken fingerprints where their records would show because when the police are going to the criminal record center they don't use your name they use the the, the fingerprints so there are people who have actually paid those admissions of fines, but their record doesn't reflect that. Why, right, Elsie? Yes, Lloyd. Can I, can I just interject? Yes. Uh, just wanting to understand if uh, an accused is reluctant or uh, is not happy to pay an admission of guilt fine, because mm. that will have detrimental consequences for mm. the accused going forward. Mm. And uh, that will actually reflect as uh, some form of a record. Mm. Uh, can the accused then decide uh, not to, to pay? To trial. What yeah. are the consequences thereof? You, yeah, they have to go to trial. But they, and, they and can. Go, yeah, they can refuse not to pay that admit the offer of an admission of of guilt. They can turn it down and then the matter will proceed to trial. And then when you are going to trial, then you have to challenge the evidence that is against you. So it means you will have to raise the defense. But can one not then uh, surmise that um, admission of guilt seems like an easy way out for most of the accused? Yes. And sometimes yes. people just feel that this is an easy way out. I'll just pay the the mm. amount set down and uh, that will resolve the issue uh, temporarily but uh, in the long term it will have consequences yes that is why a lot of people think that 
you know, I've made it go away by paying that fraction because the amount involved here is it's a minimal amount. So you will just think, wow, OK, at least it's not too bad. Let me just pay this money. And because you will be told that, no, after you've paid the, man, the money, then the whole case is over that those will be the words that you would be told. Then you'll be like, okay, no, let me just raise that 500 rand and then 10 years, 15 years down the line. Unfortunately, it, it brings up its ugly head. Yes, you are right. Uh, uh, the one who says expungement cannot be done immediately. It, it also goes according to the categories of the offenses. And the nearest that you would get it, the earliest, is 10 years' time. So that is why it is not advised for someone who wouldn't want to end up with a criminal record. Try and see if there is no uh, defense that can be raised for such a person. Elsie, can yes. I ask a question? Um, you, you're welcome. Yeah, you talk about expungement. So let's say your client has been expunged for a historic uh, criminal case um, mm -hmm. and he's, uh, he has to proceed to a new trial. He's maybe been found guilty of a new offense. Um, do you have to raise that as the attorney at the trial, or does the expungement basically nullify that previous record? Uh, as I said, where you must disclose of previous convictions as an accused is when you are applying for bail for this new offense. At bail, you must mention it. And if the matter But goes, even if it's expunged. Yes. So in most instances, remember, people, they don't know that 10 years time it's it's expunged and automatically there's even case law to that effect that anything beyond 10 years, the court shouldn't even take consideration of it. So if it comes to the attention of the court at bail stage, it won't block your chances of getting the bail. But at, okay, but the, at the trial, when the court now has to here, I mean, about, I mean, the court has to consider a sentence. The records will actually be brought. They will be printed out. And the, if it is, it is there, then it will be showing that this is something of 10 years ago. Then it would not have an effect on the type of sentence that the court will give. Okay, because what I'm trying to establish is, let's say... It, it still you, shows... But, I don't know if it, how do you get it removed. I don't know. Maybe you yeah. will have to go to the record center to say it must not even show. Now you, you apply to the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development. Then they remove the record. And then yeah, but I, I've it. seen I've seen those that are like 15 years that still show on that they call it SAP the SAP SAP what? That a record of previous convictions. SAP 69. 69. Thank you. Yeah, uh, they, they so, will still so be should, there. But aren't they obliged in terms of the law to remove that from the uh, police records if the expungement was granted? They should. They should, but I don't know. Maybe the person who presses the button there forgets to press the, the delete button. Because you know, Mus. Okay, so, the, so, so it's week. probably best just to the to disclose it at, at up front and say, okay, well, it's been expunged, but we don't know if it's still showing. Maybe just disclose it. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Renir. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's move. Awesome. I think, yes. Elsie, yeah. um, um, this case is now, I mean, the expungement. Is it depending on with regard to the uh, is it Dipo do you switch off your mic? Dipo do the mic? baby is singing. Yeah, is I can hear the baby, but it's not you. Um, no, it, it was not me. 
Oh, it's no. Percy. It's Percy to Vahale. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I think they've switched it off now. Proceed, please. Oh, my question is is um with regard to this expungement, mm. whether it, it happens automatically in respect of all kind of cases or not? No, no. There's a list of offenses that you just complete a form. I know at the police stations, they also have those forms. You pay a little amount of money for them to process that expungement. And when it's there's no issue about it, then you will just go and collect it or you go to the actual record center. So for your more serious ones, then you may, may need to make some submissions for them to be considered. So it's not like, a, I mean, I see here someone is even talking about expungement of traffic fines. It's much quicker. Mm. OK, yeah, well, I'm not that good up, I'm up too much about uh, traffic fines. But uh, here I'm talking about criminal cases that would have ordinarily been proceeding in the courts. And then those agreements are made outside to like your common assault or, it, you know, those uh, less serious, like maybe malicious damage to properties and things like that, that the person would be offered, you know, that admission of guilt payment of, of that kind of a fine. So, yeah. Please let's 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 not still be on this slide. Uh, please and remember, uh, half past seven we have to take our break. Let's proceed, please. Okay, the next method to dispose of this uh, case is a a plea of guilty. This is a plea that is going to shorten the proceedings, and this one it's happening in front of a magistrate. So. On this one, you are accepting that you are guilty of the crime that you are charged with, and you admit all the elements of that offense. And you will explain on that plea of guilty how you, you came about to commit that offense to also show that not only are you maybe prematurely pleading to the offense, but your story must show that indeed you have a full appreciation of your actions and indeed you were at fault and you acted unlawfully and your awareness also will be an issue that you would have to prove to the court that you were aware that what you were doing it was a criminal offense and that you could be punished by law for what you have done. So the background story that you would give, then the, the court will ask the prosecutor whether that story is in line with the case that they have against you. And if the prosecutors agree that yes, this is in accordance with the same uh, story that is coming from the state witnesses of how the events unfolded, then the court will accept that plea of guilt and the accused can be found guilty then based on their own uh, statements that they are making before the court and they will be pronounced as guilty as charged. So I saw that somewhere on that uh, schedule, it was said that we have to draft a guilty plea. Now, there's 213 of you here. <clears throat> How do I get you to draft a guilty plea, ladies and gentlemen? But I can assure you, that is likely to be one of the documents that you will have to draft either in your assessment and is a very common <clears throat> question that you will get in your board exams. Or are, they, are they still called board exams with the new LPC, whatever, the new act? Competency-based exam. Yes, thank you so much for that fancy English. <laughs> 
you know I'm old school, right? Pardon me, ladies and gentlemen. It's a very popular question that forms part of paper one, the criminal, not criminal, court procedures. There's also uh, the civil part and there's parts of a, uh, that a uh, paper that covers what we've been doing since Monday, criminal, co criminal court procedures. So what I can tell you about it, you see, I say on my slide, avoid using performers when you are preparing a, this guilty plea because those are very limiting in terms of the, the wording that you would be able to squeeze into those filling the missing words uh, lines that are or spaces that are left for you. So the best way is to prepare your own draft. And also, the more you draft your own, obviously your, your drafting can never be uh, getting worse. It can only improve. And to me, uh, if you get this question of draft a guilty plea, it's one of the easiest way to get marks from that exam. So first thing that you would obviously have to mention because it's a, it's a pleadings, there are going to not be a letter when you are asked to draft this. Section 112, subsection 2, uh, is there to guide you of the, the Criminal Procedure Act on how that uh, statement that you are going to make in support of this guilty plea will look like. It must be in a pleadings format. That's number one. So it cannot just be you writing like what I did there, plea of guilty, and then you start talking. So it must first of all up there say, the court, in the magistrate court for the magistrate district of whatever, or in the regional court of whatever, you know, it must be in a format of a pleadings. I hope you understand that. And then it will also, number two, after saying that uh, in the magistrate court or whatever, it will then say the name of the court held at Sophia Town Court held at uh, Bloemfontein. I don't know. Held, held at Velko. Held at whatever place where this court is sitting. Then after that, that's that's what mark number one will be in the magistrate's court. Whatever. The second mark you will get will be for saying held at this town or uh, the, the name of the court where it is sitting. That's your second mark. You will also get a mark for mentioning the case number. If you remember, I told you, the charge sheet will reflect two case numbers. What is called a cast number is the police station case number that the police uh, will give to that case. But what you are supposed to put on the guilty plea is the case number that is allocated by the prosecutors at court. It's also going to be on the chat sheet. So you will say, uh, it's it's normally uh, how they allocate it. It's according to the number of cases that they are, are, that they are placing for that month. They normally start from one, from the first case up until the last case for the month that they are placing on the on the roll. So it may be case number 87 stroke, we are in the second month, stroke two, stroke 2023. That will be the case number. That's your second, the third mark that you will have. And now you will say, in the matter between, in the matter between the state and the name of the accused. On the far right, you will say the accused. That's another mark to identify the parties involved in the matter. And then you can create your tram lines 
where inside those two lines there, you will write these words, statement made in terms of section 112 of the Criminal Procedure Act. Or you can say plea of guilty made in terms of section 112, subsection 2 of the Criminal Procedure Act or of Act 51 of 1977. There is no other act in South Africa. That's the only one. If you want to be fancy, then that's another mark. Then you jump to the body now of the plea itself. You can start it out in a format of how you would uh, ordinarily start your affidavits uh, to say the following are factors which are known and which are made and declared by the name of the accused under oath. And then now you start on a particular day at a particular place in the jurisdiction of this court, which is in the jurisdiction of the court. The accused committed the offense of theft in that he, op he opened a window that was locked at the house of the complainant and entered through the window. And once inside the window, he took the following items that must be mentioned. Took food that was in the fridge. You will say what food it was. And after he went out through the same window and left the premises. You've already given the backstory. That's another mark. Now you come to what we, we now we call the accused admissions. They, you will say the accused was aware that they didn't have permission. That's the elements of a theft now. They didn't have permission of the owner of the house to enter that house. They did enter that house with the intention of taking the food, intention is of taking the stuff, and take, after taking the things, did not intend to return them. It was also one of the elements of the offense of theft. And instead, because he couldn't finish that food, he went and sold some of the items and used the money for personal use. So that clearly shows that this was no, there was no intention to return those items. Now you've covered the elements of the offense. You can even say the accused is aware that they were uh, their actions were wrong and that they were against the law. Therefore, they will be punished for their end for their actions. And you will say that they are making that statement. Please mute, mute yourself. Please mute yourself, please. Uh, I can't see who's the person. Please mute. Uh, then they will say that they are making this statement of their own accord. They are not being coerced in any way by anyone, and they've been advised even by the by their legal rep of the consequences of making such a statement. They are pleading willingly and voluntarily. And now you are at the end you must admit, uh, sorry, you must say that this was signed at a particular place on that particular date, signed by the accused and also you who assisted as the legal rep, you will also sign. Normally that question is allocated 10 to 12 marks. So if you said all these things, you are guaranteed that full max. So I hope that you get the picture of how to draft this. You are, some of you already, I am sure you've done this, you will be doing it, but 
you can be following the, the same format as I have advised you. So now this plea is going to be presented in court in this way. After the accused now will be uh, given or he will be informed again of the charges against them. They will be asked, accused, how do you plead? Then they will say, I plead guilty. And then you as the legal rep who's are uh, assisting this, this accused, you will then in confirm that indeed the plea of guilty is in accordance with your instructions. And in support of your plea of guilty, you have prepared this statement that you would want to read it out to the court and you'll be granted permission to read it. After you read this statement, the court will ask the accused, accused, is this what you told your lawyer? Yes, that is indeed correct. Then state, you had this statement of the accused. Is it in line with your case? Can the court go ahead and accept it as evidence? If there's no objection, yes. Then the court will then give a, a verdict of a finding of guilt based on that statement of a plea of guilty. So that is how it shortens the proceedings. After that, we don't normally call any witnesses to come and say, on that day, accused did this, did this, did this. We don't normally do that. The state witnesses are likely not to come and testify again. From there, we jump into the issue of sentencing. So that is why we say, by, by entering into a plea of guilty, you are not wasting the court's time by dragging out the case having witnesses come and testify you yourself you've taken responsibility of everything and you've shortened the whole proceedings and by doing so your honesty should reflect on that guilty plea so you've played open cards with the court you've exposed yourself now and you are now at the mercy of the court the court should see that you know you've taken responsibility for your actions and you accept that you are going to be punished. So it shows what? That you are also remorseful for what you have done. That is what I say on a uh, guilty please, ladies and gentlemen. So please, last thing here, please let me finish this one. Lawyers, we say that you should always. OK, go there, Fawaz. Really? Sorry, sorry about that. Lawyers should always, uh, always act in the best interest of your client. And uh, please, money obviously should not be a motivation when you want to speedily dispose of a matter at the expense of your client. You use the plea bargaining proceedings if you are entering into a plea of guilty, as I've already uh, demonstrated to you, ladies and gentlemen, whereby you can say, okay, initially the main charge was assault GBH, please accept a plea of assault hormone because there's no proof of any injuries that were inflicted on the victim. And if everything works in your favor, then you can have that agreement with the state. They will change the charge. Then you will plead on the lesser charge. And then you can also, if you want to motivate your or to support your sent your mitigation of sentence through the use of what is called a pre-sentence through uh, the use of what is called a pre-sentence report or a correctional supervision report so this is a report that you get after you have already uh, pleaded guilty, the court has already found the accused guilty, but before a sentence is passed, a social worker will get involved and give a background to the accused, and they can also get also what is known as a victim impact report, whereby they will also interview the victims of the perpetrated offense, and after all these interviews are done, they will come with a recommendation to the court of what they considered to be a suitable sentence that the court should impose on the accused. Okay, questions? 
Melcy. Yes. I just wonder if it's with regards to the 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 format, the 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 guilty plea format. Does it is it is it standard, or it depends on the court, like your high court and your magistrate, or is it it's it's a it's one it's the same thing. It's it's not standard. It's not the same thing. So that is why I'm saying you can start it. Yes, I'm still country. Sorry, you. sorry, sorry. Let me just uh, address uh, something, please. Thank you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry about that. Uh, sorry, Menier, please repeat what you were saying. Ask, I was asking about the format uh, of the guilty plea, if it's well, it, it's the same per court or it differs. Oh, yeah. Uh, OK, yeah. So I was saying the format is up to you. And, and I was just mentioning that you may start it in a format of uh, the way you would start out your your affidavits by making that declaration under oath and whatever, but you can also just make it as a statement that you jump into, as long as you've covered, the most important thing is that the elements of the offense must be covered. The things like the date of the offense, a way it happened, how it happened, and the jurisdiction of the court are things that the court will be looking for. So it's a statement. How you draft it, it, it should just be chronological. It should make sense when it's being read. There's no particular uh, set uh, a, a, a format that you must use. But the thing is that it must be obviously in that the structure that I told you in a, a pleadings format, that it cannot be a letter. That's the only thing. So you can visit the rules of court if you just wanted to see uh, what, but the most important, that that body part of it is it's the statement that the accused is making. So if you want to make it is in a format of an, an, a, them making an oath, it's just to express that, you know, they're they not intending to lie because people who talk under oath are not supposed to be lying. But even if it doesn't say, I make these declarations under oath, the essence is that the court will be reading into the words that are said on the statement and looking whether the elements of the offense are accepted and all these other things. Legal drafting. Yeah? yeah, it's just drafting, basically. Okay, thank you, Mama. Okay. Uh, Ma'am. Sorry. You can also go to Google. You can also go to Google and just type in template for legal play. A guilty plea. It will show him. Yeah, but those are the, the 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 somebody has drafted that, and you know that's why I'm saying the, the the thing that should guide you read the section. This statement is made in terms of as a, a, a section one one two. Read that section one one two. It will guide you on the things that you need to say to ensure that like the voluntariness and all that and and the elements of the offense and so yeah if you want to look at google google is all our friend <laughs> can i ask a question yeah Elsie, um, um with regards to the statement you've made uh, lawyers must act in the best interest of their client mm. does it mean a lawyer can be a bias towards the other party in representing their client even though they know their client shouldn't have uh, agreed. Um, how can I put it in an example where um, 
how can I put it in now? I'm not sure if it's relevant. The seller allowed uh, the purchaser to occupy uh, the premises without occupational rent. But the minute there was a delay on registering the property for six months, all of a sudden the purchaser wants the occupational rent. Now I'm saying to the, uh, what's this now, the, the lawyer that look, your client has, have, has waived that right. So I'm not sure whether the lawyers can be biased because I mean, the, their client has agreed without even telling the lawyer that look, I've allowed this person to stay on the premises without paying any rent up until the registration of the house. Yeah, you see that, yeah, every lawyer that is, is, is doing their best in the case of their client, but also a sense and logic should prevail. So you cannot do, I mean, something like oh, the example you are giving, if you're saying that six months is, is going to be the period that this person will be allowed to stay for free. So you are saying that, uh, you know, uh, this person should continue paying that bond for someone who, you understand what you mean, what what you are saying in your case. So I'm um, if it were a, a if you would want to somehow, I mean, lawyers, we are not working against each other. You can maybe then seek some settlement of the issue instead, and not want an entire situation where one party is entirely prejudiced. So offer to pay some few months, maybe if you can agree on paying three months instead of the entire six months for free. Oh, I see. So you negotiate with your opponent there and say, okay, fine, you are the ones who said we can stay for free, but we do understand that your client also is bleeding now money that they didn't anticipate. So the best we can do to help your case is maybe pay two months or three months, and then maybe they'll go back to that line, and then you, you find a common ground. Oh, okay. Yeah, not swindling them. I'm, I'm sure you just try to think for <laughs> them. Yeah, you're not swindlers. Yeah. <laughs> These are colleagues. Tomorrow, you know, we remember things, and when you're dealing with them in another case, they may not be so, you know, uh, open and uh, willing to assist with something that they would have helped you. They, you know, you know, they will have that in the back of their mind that uh, that lawyer, yo, I, you know. So yeah, but let's not get out of line of what we are saying. Please, I'm moving. If we don't have any other questions here, I want to uh, move to the next aspect. Quickly, just one question, um, if you don't mind. Can yes. in the plea bargaining, can he put at the end there, I am remorseful for the act that I have for this, what I have done. Yeah. Does, can you put that in? Yes, it's your words. It's the statement of the accused. If he wants to say, I am deeply sorry. Yeah. That you can say, I'm deeply sorry. I have even gone as far as apologizing to the witnesses. But remember, those though they don't really have a bearing on the guilt. They will have a bearing on the the, the type of sentence that would yeah. you'd be asking on the court. So they are just really in, unnecessary to be said at that stage. You would okay. leave that for sentencing. Thank you. Thank you, Elsie. You're, you're welcome. So uh, you can make that plea, right? That we all now understand what is a guilty plea. And then, like I said, it's going to be read out in court. And it happens that either maybe the state says, mm -mm, we are not happy about uh, the contents of this guilty plea. It's lacking important aspects about how this offense was committed. Because I told you, you have to say a background story and the state must agree that your background story is in line with what the witnesses are saying happened. So maybe they, they are not happy that mm, it's like we're talking about two different cases here, only that the offense is the same. Maybe they're not happy with that. Or maybe they feel that somehow you are still justifying yourself uh, by your actions, trying to make yourself not guilty. Then the court will now probe clearly on that and try to determine. To say it's in yes. In, in such a case, can I'm still, the court... 
I'm can talking on the plea. Please hold on, yeah. please. Please on that plea. Can the court yeah. apply yeah. restorative justice? Anything that you want that on sentence, you can suggest to the court. We are coming to sentence. We'll talk about that as well. Sipo. Okay. Ne? So okay. now the court is, 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 is hearing this guilty plea. And you see of what I was just asked here now to things like uh, you, are, you are making yourself look remorseful. Please be careful on how you phrase that plea. Because if you sound as if you are really not at fault, the court is going to, 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 to doubt whether you are fully pleading guilty. You see, and the court wouldn't want to accept a plea that is not, you know, fully admitting everything. So even though you had initially, the accused had initially said, yes, I plead guilty. Now, when the court is listening to this uh, statement of why the accused says he's pleading guilty, and now there's things that are showing that the accused is not fully pleading to the charge, the court is in terms of section 113 of the criminal procedure, is entitled to change that plea of guilty to a not guilty. That is not a nice situation. Because you've now said accused is pleading guilty, but the court does not accept because the court says, mm -mm, there's an offense, I mean, there's a some type of a defense that is being raised within your guilty plea. So if you are entering a guilty plea, oh, I forgot to say also because of uh, those questions that were being uh, asked uh, when we were talking about the best interest of the client, please be careful with these guilty pleas. You know, there's a very common thing that you would get out there, I don't know so whether it's true or not, that there's going to be allegations that the lawyers were, you know, the ones who made me, like the accused, they will say, they they forced me or they, they somehow left me no choice, you know, that I have to plead guilty. So please ensure that, like it says on that slide, willingly and voluntarily makes this plea without any undue influence from you. So, where there's a sense that something is amiss on this guilty plea, the court will quickly turn around that guilty plea and make it into a not guilty. So what does that mean? It means now those witnesses that you were hoping will not come <coughs> and testify and give all the details about, you know, what uh, had happened when that offense happened, they will actually be coming now. The court will come and hear the gory details of everything, you know. And obviously the court will now be having this at the back of their minds when they have to impose a sentence. So only be, you know, try to be short and concise in your guilty plea. Give the necessary details and, and really try to avoid anything that may look as if you are trying to now distance yourself somehow or, or or reverse from, you know, what you were initially saying, go back on your way that you are pleading guilty because that's the, 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 the effect of a 113 now. Witnesses are going to come and testify. Now the state, I mean, uh, the, the defense will have to cross-examine them. You know, more exhibits will be presented in terms of reports and whatever that the state would have called you know the, like your dna and whatever they will now all of them they will be brought before the court and there are situations where this guilty plea has been changed to a 113 which is actually a not guilty plea and the, the whole evidence is led and you can actually have an outcome where after everything the accused is going to be found not guilty, ladies and gentlemen. Can I switch on the light? So that happens. Uh, Ma'am? Yes. Uh, just to avoid your plea, 
the reversal of your plea from guilty to not guilty. Mm. Isn't it advisable for only an accused to say, yes, I plead guilty, and the attorney to avoid to write a statement? Can you repeat that? I say in order to avoid uh, your plea not mm. to be reversed, to be not pleading guilty, mm. isn't it advisable that only the accused can plead guilty and you as a defense attorney not to write a statement you know to support what? the pleading guilty? Let me tell you the common practice in the courts. In the past, the courts were very open to take guilty pleas from the accused. But because of the fact that uh, there were so many re, uh, cases that came where people were said to be wrongfully found guilty, even on those guilty pleas specifically, all those cases where an accused does a guilty enters a guilty plea on their own, they are automatically reviewable. They go on review. And when a case goes on review, it's going to the judges. And that uh, magistrate is going to be expected to now give a full report of how they have accepted a guilty plea of that person. So it, it, it's adding an extra admin work on a... The, the part of the presiding officers on top of everything else that they have to do. So the general attitude is that they prefer that accused persons shouldn't plead on their own. They must be assisted by a legal representative. So they rarely accept, you know, unless if it's those very adamant accused who says no, 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 no. You know, generally, they would say, no, I'm not taking a plea. You have a right to bring your own attorney. Legal aid is available to assist you for free. Please, um, I'm not going to take this plea. They are reluctant to take guilty pleas of unrepresented accused. So that is the challenge that you will face. And why, when you are paid to take a case, you will go to court and your client says, I'm pleading guilty. They stand in the court when the charge is put to them. They say, yes, I'm guilty. You, you stand up, you confirm, and now you abandon them after they paid you. You have to see the matter to the end. So the courts generally are reluctant to take those kind of guilty pleas. So you, you're not going to win there. That, does that apply to state attorneys? those free attorneys that you get in court? Legal aid lawyers, you mean? Yes. They are commonly used by the court to use, to assist those unrepresented accused. And it's actually in the mandate of legal aid attorneys that they must fish out. Because remember, the legal aid uh, services are for free. They must look out, be on the lookout on, of unrepresented accused. And when they see them, they must approach them and say, I am LCCB, I'm from Legal Aid South Africa. You have a right to have me assist you for free. I'm a legal aid lawyer who can assist you. I mean, so you have to, it's not touting, like, unlike, you know, the other uh, private lawyers are not allowed to approach uh, clients. Legal aid lawyers, they have to approach them because the constitution says every accused person has a right to a legal representative. So it's the mandate of legal aid lawyers. They must assist those unrepresented people. You see? Okay, so yeah. So the next thing I say there, uh, there is also a situation where the accused initially intended to now plead not guilty. They are entitled at any stage. When they are listening to the testimonies of the state witnesses and they are hearing that only bullets and bombs are coming their way, like there's too much heat 
in terms of how these witnesses are implicating them. The accused is entitled at any stage to now stand up and say they are wishing to change their plea, but this must be done before the court gives judgment. So then if that is the case, after the accused, because you know, sometimes people, they like to take chances and say, let me see how, you know, because we don't know. We were not there when the incident happened. Them, they say, no, I know that witness, maybe it's generally not a good speaker or whatever. I don't know, they make their own judgment of the person. And the witness actually comes and is so impressive, you know, the way they are relating the events to the court. And yo, is implicating them, you know, saying things that are showing that, yeah, yeah, this person is going south. So you as the attorney, when they inform you, either they inform you or you yourself of the assessment of the evidence that is presented, you can suggest to your client that, look, my man, ah, or my woman, sorry, guys, you may say, look, mm -mm, that initial story that you gave me, it, it does, it's unlikely to hold water before the court. Are you still certain that you want to proceed and you are not now forcing them, you are just showing them based on the dangers that are now exposed at them, that look, there is an option for you to make some admissions if you would like, and then the court will, will hear that there are some admissions and obviously then there may be some things that you don't admit, but you will have to also then also prepare a statement to that effect. Section 220 is another draft that you are likely to be asked to, proceed, to, to draft. So the same forward format that I told you about. <laughs> Someone says, look, my man, Zia Kala. <laughs> yes, fire is on now. So. The same forward of a guilty plea, right? Of a pleadings format, it's going to be followed in the same. So it's going to carry almost the same marks of a section 112 guilty plea, this section 220. Now, in the body of your statement, you will now say, I admit that on this day I was or I was at this place. I did this, I did that, right? And after you have admitted, 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 there may be some things that you don't admit. Then you will say, I deny that I did this and that. I deny that I did that, this and that. So at the end of the day, uh, you sign you sign it on a particular date at a particular place signed by yourself as the legal rep and the accused so it's almost the same the only difference with the section 220 admissions is that there it can contain a denials statements that are not admitted but a section 112 guilty plea you are admitting everything in that uh, guilty plea Section 220 is not a guilty plea. It's just admissions. So once you have made this uh, statement of admissions and the, 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 admit, the denials are also indicated on that statement, the court will then take it as conclu conclusive proof of the facts that are contained therein and it may subsequently find the accused guilty based on that statement and it can convict based on that statement as well, just like with a guilty plea. So those particular issues that are not admitted now, it will now call for the state to uh, lead evidence of only that which is being disputed. So it, the, the witnesses that are coming to testify, they will be curtailed in how they will testify. They will immediately be told, look, the accused has already admitted this, admitted this, admitted this. Uh, only issue is that he denies this. Now let's deal with that issue of what they are denying. Then the witnesses will talk on the denials. Okay, sorry, hey, I've jumped my slide here. May I come in, please? Yes. So 
in terms of the, the statement of admission of guilt, the, the, the heading says statement in terms of section 112. Uh, yes, yes. Well, yeah. the, the heading on this one is for section 22. Would Admissions be, in terms of section 220. Which also contains denial in, in. Yes. Only 220 will contain denials. 112 is not supposed to contain denials. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So then, and after a 112 is fully accepted, judgment is given you are immediately going to be found guilty based on that 112. Guilty plea. Immediately found guilty, so case is finished. Now we move to sentencing. With a 220 admissions, witnesses are still coming to testify to close the gaps about those issues that are denied so that the court can make a decision who to believe now about the issues that are denied, whether indeed accused is a right for denying them or the court should accept the witnesses of the state who say, no, 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 he's lying by denying those issues. And then now after that, there will be arguments like a normal trial, both by the state and the defense, and then the court will have to give judgment. Okay, so wherein the state has led evidence closed its case, if the evidence the evidence presented against the accused was overwhelming, <clears throat> I did say, or the, then the defense was a, was not able to discredit the witnesses, you would then inform the accused of this option. So this would be, for instance, where. You started, for instance, with a rape trial that was a, based on a bare denial. Until the DNA much later came to court and it's positive. You see, if you don't have anything to challenge on the DNA, then you will now... We are on slide number eight uh, for the one asking. So then now you would have to advise that line that, look, are you, are you challenging this DNA? Do you have anything? And if you, from your legal point of view, you don't see how you could uh, successfully challenge the DNA evidence, then you inform them that there is that option of making some admissions. Okay. We move. So, uh, that is, oh, somebody said I must talk about admissions and uh, confessions. Uh, that one is for definition. This admission, it can be a statement that is informally made. An admission can be made informally by an, a words that are said, maybe by an accused at the time of arrest or even in... Uh, I'm I'm coming there, please. So it's 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 going to be used as a more of an informal process whereby the accused made admission to admit the commission of the offense. But with a confession, the process is formal. It will be done in writing by a, a rank police of captain and above and all that so guys please uh, i'm sure that is in your guides if you want to know the difference uh, specific but a confession is bare it's formal and there's specific guidelines on how it must be done and if anything uh, is not complied with even if the contents of that confession were linking the accused to the confession to the commission of the crime like it was taken down by a constable, not a captain, but it is actually a confession of, of, of having committed the offense. It's something that is not going to be uh, uh, making that confession to be admissible to the court. 
So there's specific requirements with a confession that must be strictly uh, co uh, co complied with. But with an admission, it can be just words that were said and they, could, they can now be repeated by the person who says, this is what the accused admitted. So it doesn't have to be reduced into writing and ranks and all those things. So it's more informal. That's the most uh, I can say on those two. Ma'am Elsie? Yes. Uh, can I have a question in these 220 admissions, please? Thank you. Yes. If the facts that are denied are successfully defended by the defense attorney, will the accused be acquitted or he may yes. be convicted then given the lesser sentence because he already admitted to some of the facts? It can actually have a defect that the entire, depends on what they admitted, but the outcome, it can be a completely a, a finding of not guilty or it can be guilty but on a lesser charge. So here maybe you, you, it's, it's going to be something that you will use for a 220. It will be, for instance, where uh, the state is, is adamant that they will not accept a plea on a lesser charge. But already the accused is not really denying. But you would have preferred that they have accepted a plea on a lesser charge. Then you will admit the elements of the lesser charge. And then it continues, and the court will not hopefully find on the main the main charge that they've 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 proceeded with. Or it it can actually be a not guilty entirely. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. So I ask. Yes. Yes. So if, say, the accused uh, is admitting to the elements of a lesser lesser uh, charge and then they are found guilty on a competent verdict, will that be mitigating in terms of sentencing? To say the accused in the beginning did admit to this one, but yeah. then they were... Oh, okay, no, thank you. Yeah, the court will also... When you are mitigating, then you will say the accused never even denied even in his 220 admissions, he did admit that that is actually what, yeah. So, yes. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we move to the next topic here that I briefly touch on what is called interlocutory procedures. And uh, section 77, 78, and 79 of the Criminal Procedure Act deals with a criminal capacity of an accused person. Now, at any stage, at any stage of the proceedings, it can be even in the middle of the trial, at any stage can be just as the court was about to give sentence, at any stage. When it transpires that the accused is unable to follow the proceedings or there are questions surrounding the mental fitness of this person to stand trial, you are going to call for these sections to be applied in that case. Now, the court must hold what is known as an inquiry to determine whether the accused is fit to stand trial. And the court is going to be uh, based, uh, the, the inquiry will be based on the information that will be presented before it, either by the accused or family members or someone who has knowledge of the medical background of the accused. And if you have documents, you can also introduce documents. Like to say, for instance, that uh, the accused was an, an outpatient who was attending a mental institution, receiving medical treatment for a mentally-related issue you will introduce that to the court. This does not mean that only if you have medical evidence can you now ask the court to hold this inquiry. A mere observation of you as the lawyer, remember you talk to your client and you may see that mm, something is amiss here. And even the people in the court, they will talk and say, ah, this client of yours, yo, 
it's like it's one of those cuckoo clients, you know, like something like that. It suffices for you to now bring this to the attention of the court that you worship. I stand against you as a legal uh, a, a person. I don't obviously have the medical, uh, full medical uh, assessment of the accused, but I can pick up that there's something amiss about the conduct of this accused. They don't seem to be, you know, very okay mentally. You see the words that I'm using. I'm questioning their sanity somehow, even though I'm not a doctor, but it's based on the fact that they can't make out a clear story when I'm consulting with them. They are, you know, whatever story that they are giving to me, it's all over the place. It doesn't make sense. And even their conduct, it shows that they are, you know, somehow acting in and up, somehow showing men, some mental issues with how they are, you know, communicating towards me as their lawyer. So I'm concerned that this person might not be able to be fit to stand trial. That's your own observation. That suffices. Or if someone comes to you and they tell you that no, the accused is known in the in the in the neighborhood that is someone who has a mental problem. That is the words that you will say. He's known to have a mental problem. And it's something that we know from the time they were very young. It's how everyone gives them a, a different treatment because they know that you can't always take everything they do seriously because they have a, a mental problem. Then why by saying that the court cannot ignore that, it must now have this uh, person sent to a mental institution to be observed by now medical experts who will be a doctor, you know, in a psychiatrist, a psychologist, then they will compile a report that they will bring to court and they will now give their um, report to say whether this person is fit to stand trial or not. And you are entitled to call witnesses to testify about the history of the accused and produce any other medical proof without even saying the doctor who was examining must come. If it's just a piece of paper, maybe, or it may be even tablets, medicine that uh, this person is taking. If you can Google and you see that these are normally, uh, you know, medicines that are taken by people who suffer from schizophrenia or whatever, then you can even say, these are the medicines that were given to me, your worship, and the name of the tablets here, it says this, and these are medicines that are normally taken by mental, mental patients. That suffices. Now, this also goes into the issue that is very common now, ladies and gentlemen, depression. There's mental illness, there's mental retardation. So you need to be clear. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Ma'am Elsie, can I just interject you there? Yeah. May I ask a quick question? So what happens in a case the accused is not amenable to being submitted for an evaluation? So he's basically reluctant or defies that decision and is protesting against it. Is he forced? Are they going to have some measures to actually get him to the place, escort him? So a typical case like that, how do they go about it? The court is going to hold an inquiry. That inquiry, it will include all that, that what you just said, and the court will have to find out this reluctance, why? And if it is then found that they are going to not come, I mean, cooperate, because yes, there are those who will be outside, like on bail, and then they will be allocated a time when they need to be going for this observation time, then they will only go for that time of observation and then they will come back. But if it's an erratic person who appears unreasonable and appears to not be a safe person that can actually hurt himself or those around them, you can even request the court that no, they must be kept, you know, in custody awaiting them being sent to this observation, or the court itself can make that that a decision to say 
you will be kept in custody because we are not sure about your state, but it, the, the likelihood is that you are not safe. So the only way to keep this person safe is to keep them under in under uh, the watch of the authorities. So it's an order of court. So you can't say no. Um, Elsie, I have a question regarding the consequences of being found not competent to stand trial. So let's say, for instance, you as the person's attorney realize that there's something, there is something wrong with this person mentally. And obviously then the court ends up agreeing with you to say that, or you were able to prove that they're either bipolar, schizophrenic, or they suffer from psychosis, whichever one it is. What are the consequences of that? Does that person... I don't know how to ask this. Does that it's person... fine. I got it. I got it. I got it. So yeah. the consequences is that after they've gone for the mental observation, we mm -hmm. will get you will get a report of mm -hmm. the experts who are medically trained. Now they will say all those conditions that you've mentioned. Then they will say, obviously, because of this mental uh, illness that this person suffers, they will not be able to stand trial. Then the state is going to now I, uh, inform the court that they would maybe want this person to go for further mental treatment in this psychiatric uh, institution, mental institution. And then they will also request the court to declare them as a mental, sorry, a state patient, right? And then the, 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 the effect is that in... Uh, eventually, then they, the charges will not proceed. They will withdraw the charges because they are now a state patient that is going to receive treatment at a mental institution. So they will withdraw the charges. Okay, so oh. I, I have a follow-up question for that. So let's say, for instance, you have somebody who committed a heinous crime like murder, for instance, and um, it's proved, it's easily proven because maybe there is video or something with surveillance there were surveillance cameras where he committed the crime and it clearly is the person who's committing the crime in that um in that video without a question but then later on in the trial it is found that the person actually has a mental illness and does this person one does it mean that they will not be found guilty um on the grounds of mental illness and two do they then have a criminal record even though they are going to be uh, a state patient? That is why I said three sections. Section 78, sec I mean 77, 78, and 79 relate to the situation where the issue of mental illness came up at the time of the commission of the offense. And also, mental illness can show up at the time when they have to stand trial. So when that is the, the case, then that person will not be found guilty. There is no court that can convict a, mental, a, a mentally unfit person. It can happen, on, you know, there's a, what they call a lucid interval. Uh, for, yeah. 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 So if it was something that it, it just happened briefly at the time of the incident that they suffered, that mental illness and it can be proven that they were not of the right state of mind at the time of the commission of the offense there's lots of cases and this is particularly very common with those women who mm. were called the battered woman syndrome women who've undergone abuse for a lot of years and at the hands of their abuser they eventually snap and they kill them so it was that snapping that brings it, it qualifies them to have had and a, a moment of a, 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 a mental unfitness, then, <coughs> then you can. Let's take our break. Then, if you prove that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is the, the result. So, 10 minutes, we start at 22. Thank you. Mm. 
Mama. Sorry, I'm so sorry, guys. Mistake. Hello. 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 Mic. You Your mic is on. Your mic. this question in terms of uh, your section uh, 112 application does it mean that you relinquish your privilege against self incrimination I think right to silent and the right to self-incrimination go hand in hand. And if uh, uh, if uh, an accused have elected to plead guilty, then that automatically falls away. Okay, thank you. Yes. And also the court will question you about the that pleading of guilt of yours. Of course, when you tender a plea of guilty, the court will ask you question with regards to whether truly uh, that statement is a statement of yours. And uh, to ascertain whether, of course, you made that statement uh, freely and without uh, influence of whatsoever but if you accept truly that the statement is yours and you made that statement without any form of influence then the the the, the accused i mean the 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 court will now accept that uh, that uh, truly you have a good good thank you colleagues
We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so I think uh, what I wanted to say also on this mental illness issue, on the uh, criminal capacity was that we should also be able to make a distinction between <clears throat> mental illness and mental retardation. And uh, because when the accused does not suffer from mental illness, the report would likely come back and say that they will be able to uh, proceed with the proceedings because that are normal, the mental retardation, mental retardation uh, conditions, they will say they are easily treatable with medication. So if the accused is confirmed to have mental retardation, if they stay on their medication and really it's not a severe case, they are able to fully understand the proceedings of court and they would say that they are fit to stand trial. Now, obviously then if the case is severe, then they can lead to a mental illness. And also please note that the effects of a extended abuse of drugs can also lead to an accused person having a mental illness. So, yeah, that is all I wanted to say there. A uh, question? Yeah. Um, normally, what I want to ask is that in, I want to compare it in with um, civil proceedings. In civil proceedings, like for example, let me just make a example of road external fund methods where you you as an attorney, you identify the problems and you get to probably appoint certain expect on what you think is the problem or the injuries that are acquired. So in criminal proceedings, if I, I assume that my client has a mental problem, am I, should I be the first one to initiate to take them to um, specialist? Therefore, no. after no. I, if they report, therefore the state will do the same on their side. Or, should I also should I just um, present it first to the presiding officer? Present it first to the court, and that referral will be done at the state expense at a, a state mental institution. Now the situation also comes that you may actually disagree for whatever reasons that you may have. Maybe you the when the report comes back, you are still uh, of the view that the person. It is, as they say, is fit to stand trial. But you see that no, this person, we, there's no way they don't follow anything that I say to them, they're not going to be able to stand trial. You can refer them for another referral to a mental institution of the state again. If they were seen maybe by a, maybe one <clears throat> medical doctor and a, a psychiatrist, they will actually bring on more doctors like psych a psychologist, and then they will give an in-depth report also, which is more uh, you know comprehensive than the initial one that you, you got before. And you, they can even come and testify in court if you, wa you want to put them through questioning to address your concerns about the mental fitness that they say they find on this person, yet you, you have this challenge with the person. So depending on how you, you show that, I mean, they can also say, okay, maybe once more, they take them in for a, another a round of observation and they will come back. So maybe they may come back agreeing with you, but if they don't agree with you, you can also uh, get your own external expert at your own expense to come and counter the report that has been given by the state doctors. That's at your own <clears throat> at, at your own expense. You're, you can do that. <coughs> sorry. So will it be sorry? A follow-up question. Will it be um, unethical if I firstly, if I have my own suspicion, then I firstly take them to my own specialist to just to uh, validate my what I'm thinking about this client? No, it's not. If they are outside, like on bail, you can do that <clears throat> and you can present that report and then the state 
will not accept your report on face value. They will also want to satisfy themselves. Then oh. they will then still, you know, do their own uh, checks on that. And then the only way to counter your report is also by, you know, sending him with your doctor's report to the institution and then then the, the court would like will then have to make an assessment based on the two reports and then it will make a, a decision whether the person is fit or not. But where fitness was such a big issue of private doctors, state doctors and whatever was an issue and the lawyer was so adamant that no, there's something wrong and it may even show up maybe at times that their behavior was, <clears throat> you know, showing that there was actually something wrong with how they expressed themselves even when they testified in court. The judges will pick on that, you know, should this person obviously be found guilty and then maybe you, you, you take this matter up on appeal. The record will show that there was something here and that, will, that the judges will not accept that there were questions about fitness because that is why the legislature says you don't even have to bring medical evidence of a person that they have a, a actual a problem of a mental condition. You just have to make an allegation. So the court cannot ignore that allegation. If the judges find that that was really a big issue and it was continually brought up and ignored by the court, then you may actually have a very good ground of appeal. Okay. That can turn around the whole conviction and sentence. Sorry, I've got a question. Yes. Um, in let's not let's not be too long, please, ladies and gentlemen. But I think you've got the gist. Try not really. There's still a lot more that we have to cover within the little time that we have. I'm not stopping you, but I'm just saying be mindful that as long as you got the gist, if you want to read more, the sections are there. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yes, have, let's hear you. Yeah, I just have a question uh, in terms of this mental illness. If you bring a, a um, your your accused, you bring the defense brings the accused forward. Um, who's who's the uh, proof? Who has the proof otherwise? The state or the defense to say that this accused is maybe not mentally um, incapable? The state, <clears throat> the state doctors can bring a report to say yes, the person is unfit to stand trial, and the state witness, the state doctor's report can also come and say the person, the accused, is fit to stand trial. So it's not that the state doctors are for the state. They must only bring a report to say the accused is fit. They must do their doctoring job and give a fair assessment of the accused as they've observed him and help the court to reach a, a decision that is correct regarding proceedings of the court. Okay, so, okay now that's fine. I just wanted to know, because I recall in, uh, when we studied the LLB, they specifically said that um, when a defense raises this issue of mental illness, the onus is on the state to prove otherwise that the, the accused is now not mentally. Uh, the state does, <clears throat> no, the state doesn't have to challenge it. It's only the medical evidence that will tell, that will guide the court whether this person is able to follow the proceedings or not. But I've answered you. So if we, there's issues of experts that are disagreeing, then you will call those experts and they will have to be telling the courts their own expertise of whatever they, their own observation based on their expertise, then the court will have to <clears throat> decide. But I'm telling you, if those two experts from both sides were debating at, at each other about the fitness of this person, I'm telling you that's a very risky case to proceed with because should the court convict eventually on that case, it's a very good case to appeal. So if you, they don't allow joint minutes. What is that? A joint minute will be where there's two different reports from two different aspects, maybe for the accused and uh, the defendant, and therefore both aspects, they assess the client at the same time. They, they, they assess their report with the client present at the same time to see that they cannot come with something conclusive and it's called joint minute where they both make one report. That can be arranged if they, the state 
uh, doctors don't have a problem with your external uh, expert. If they don't have a problem, they can also be sitting in when they are making observations and they can as medical doctors liaise with each other if they agree. But I don't know if you can force them to allow your, your external doctor to come there. I don't know. Okay, go and research more about that, please. Let's move. The next uh, intellectual interlocutory procedure that we're dealing with is a trial within a trial. And this is what happens uh, when there's a dispute regarding the issues concerning ad, uh, admissibility of evidence. <clears throat> and example will be where the state tries to introduce a, a self-incriminating statement, like a confession. So where there is issues about how that confession was obtained, then there's going to be a need to now leave the whole trial and enter into a trial within a trial to establish whether everything was above board in how that confession was obtained. And if there's doubt, then that confession will not be admissible in the court. And where there are inconsistencies on a state witness's statement as compared to their testimony given in court. <clears throat> so you will also go and cross-examine a witness based on the statement that they gave to the police and the statement that they are giving in the court. Now, if you are saying the uh, differences in what was said to the police and what they are telling the court, remember, both these statements were made under oath. Now you will then you will then have to lead evidence, particularly on how the police statement was taken. And uh, I've talked to you already about the arrest and searches and seizure situation that are often challenged also in court when we spoke about the matter of the state versus. Who uh, matter? Who matter? Thank you. Yeah. So. That's another clear case where you see how <clears throat> that, that trial within a trial happens and then issues like that are dealt with there. Reviews is the next topic that uh, where a matter can also be taken on a review before the conclusion of a trial. So if you are alleging that there's a gross irregularity that the court has done, or the manner in which the proceedings are being undertaken, then you will have to stop the proceedings of the trial and then you refer this matter for a review. Then the court, the high court will then give guidance whether everything is fine and if not, then they will come with an outcome of that review. The grounds on which you can take a matter for a review would be, for instance, if you are challenging the jurisdiction of the court. You are saying this court has no jurisdiction to be hearing this matter. Where you are saying that <clears throat> the presiding officer has an interest in the case, not cause, that's a typing error. Uh, sorry about that. And also where you are now alleging that there is bias on the part of the presiding officer or malice, or corruption, then you are also even a, maybe even a making a request for the court to recuse themselves from this matter, but they are proceeding anyway. So there's gross irregularities in these proceedings and also the manner of the evidence that is being admitted when you are of the view that no, this evidence should not have been admitted. It was unconstitutionally obtained. This evidence should have been rejected by the court. Those are the matters that you can take on a review. So where you see that the presiding officer has an interest on the outcome of the matter, and the person that is to be tried before them 
is going to suffer a great prejudice, then you apply for a recusal of the presiding officer. There are instances where the presiding officer themselves will do what is called a self-recusal. I told you of the example of the celebrity who was involved in a, a motor collision where children passed away. And the presiding officer was supposed to hear a bail application, but for his own reasons, they recused themselves from the proceedings. So that's a good example there. And also, where a presiding officer is asked to recuse themselves, but they refuse and they continue with the case, but you are of a view that you, you had good grounds for them uh, to recuse themselves, you can take them on, on a review or if the matter continues and it ends up with a conviction, then that is also going to be a very good ground of appeal to show that there was a <clears throat> clear evidence throughout the trial of a bias on the part of the presiding officer. You asked for them to recuse themselves, they refused. And at the end, exactly what you were expecting has happened. They've convicted and sentenced your client. So you take them on. So that is all, ladies and gentlemen, regarding uh, these interlocutory procedures. And uh, I think we are pressed for time. So do we have any particular ex uh, questions? I want to jump to the main trial. I have a few slides that I want to run through that we can do within the, the limited time that we have. So can we not go out of all of the way? But I, I mean, I do discuss these things so that you can know that it is possible when you are dealing with a case and you are unhappy that you can ask. We've seen it also, for instance, in the case of a, the judge who was dealing with a, that pastor. Oh, no, it just recently happened. I think in Peter Marisberg, the case of the former president, the in 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 Peter Damarisbeck, I heard that the judge just recently self recusal of that judge. So I mean that's clear. Judge Kuhn, yes. So you know what I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen. Quick question on review. Yes. Uh, on this review, whenever I picked up that maybe. There's an evidence that is admissible that I feel should not be admissible. Then should I start to approach the presiding officer regarding the evidence, or should I just go straight to the higher court to, to get this matter reviewed? It's your decision. <clears throat> you just prepare your papers for review. You inform the court that you are sending the matter to on review, and you send them. You don't need their permission. OK, no, thanks. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, we finally got to the main part. Um, um, we've, we've already talked a lot about it. So this is going to run through, uh, we're going to run through this fairly quickly because, you know, through all this that we've been talking about, we've been touching on issues of the trial. But mainly this is what happens in a trial. As I've told you, it starts with the state putting the charge on the accused. And you will be asked, how do you plead? And the accused will then say, not guilty. This is how we enter a trial. Now, you as the defense lawyer will stand up also now and say, yes, you confirm your appearance and that indeed your instructions are that the accused is pleading, not guilty. Who goes first after you've said that? The state. They will now have the prosecutor, uh, after they've read this charge, accused has pleaded, Accused is asked if he understands the charge and how he pleads to it. Then the accused the, a lawyer will confirm the plea. And if there's any statement, you as the defense lawyer, we've spoken about this already, that you can elect to make a statement or exercise the right to remain silent, which means now the state will now start calling their first witness to testify. 
That is how a, a, a trial starts. Okay. Who starts uh, leading this witness is the prosecutor by the evidence in chief. Now, under evidence in chief, the state is going to ask no leading questions. So the court <clears throat> and you too, as the defense lawyer, you will be on guard to watch that. Ah, oh, good night, Fawaz. Good night, Bemi. Good night. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes, the babies are saying good night. Good night, everyone. <laughs> they stayed up a bit late because it's Friday. Okay, so you watch this. Um... Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the hearts, guys. We received them. Thank you. Uh, you are going to watch for this. The state will ask, ma'am or say whoever is the witness. The questions must be. Tell us what happened. Obviously, the date may not be an issue. What happened in, on this date that has led you to be here in court today? You see, tell us how you were assaulted. Tell us where, you, where, where, where were you when the incident happened. Tell us who was with you when you were assaulted, as you see. You see, so this is asking the witness to give the story in their own ways, they will give the whole story. They are not uh, being told what to say. So you watch that the witnesses must flow in that line. And where you see that now, this not, I mean, the prosecutor is not allowing the witness to tell the story in their own ways. You are going to jump. You interfere and you say, excuse me, your worship, the witness is not being allowed to tell the story in their own words. Can my colleague, the prosecutor, allow the witness to tell us what has happened? So you can disrupt when you see that they are putting words in the mouth of the witness. Clear, ladies and gentlemen, right? The train is moving. Thank you. Now. They've told us in their own words, the gruesomeness, the gory details and everything. And there was nothing like a leading that happened there. They cried and you had to take breaks at times <clears throat> to allow them to compose themselves. And you came back, they continued lamenting the, the sad story and finished. Now you come in to cross-examine the witness. Now you may ask leading questions. I demonstrate by saying, ma'am, you told this court that the accused slapped you with an open hand on your face. You see, that's a leading question. But please, when you do this, Preparation is of utmost importance because the better you know your case, you know what is your defense, you know the scene of the crime, and you may actually have visited the scene if the scene is a big issue in the case. Go and do your own inspection in loco, that is visiting the scene of the crime, before you actually take the court and the prosecutor and everyone to that scene. Make sure you have seen it yourself, if you can. Because whatever uh, story that you may be hearing from your client, you know, it may lack some details or it may be a, a, an exaggeration. So if you are having a big issue about the scene, it helps that you have gone there. So preparation is of of utmost importance. Because when you know your case well, you are going to be able to ask better questions. And you will ask questions that you will know the answer that you want. And here's a big one. 
the questions that you ask, please make sure that they are short and direct. So don't ask open-ended questions because you may hear what you don't want to hear. Wherever possible, ask questions that will elicit an answer of yes or no. Ma'am, you were at the house of the accused on the day of que in question. If it's not an in dispute, the answer will be yes. You know that they were together. So you ask questions that will make them to say yes or no. Avoid those open-ended questions that will elicit an explanation from a witness. You do not want this witness when you say to them, ma'am, tell us why would, uh, why do you say the accused is the one who attacked you? Please, defense lawyers, don't ever ask that question. you will hear demons and devils out of that answer. Don't ever say, why do you say the accused is the one? Say a statement, accused is not the one who attacked you. You are making a statement and that is based on the instructions that you have. If you want, you can say, the accused will come and tell this court that he is not the one that attacked you. That's a statement. You are not asking them, why do you say he's the one? Don't also use this very, I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, please. We don't use, <laughs> yes, we don't use, I put it to you question. Tell them what you want to say. You will see it happening, please don't do it. Where the witness answers with an explanation that you did not ask for, interject. Call them out and say, ma'am, I did not ask you to explain. Answer my question. My question to you is, -da 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 -da, put your statement and then get your answer from them. If they are being a... <laughs> Yeah, we all know the phrase of I put it to you. We don't like it. Determine, obviously, your own style as you go along. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm running through this because you are going to get to a course that is called trial advocacy, ladies and gentlemen. The name of this course is criminal court practice. But I was just giving you some ideas. So yes, you'll even actually practice these things that I'm talking about. So we don't stress about it and say, Elsie didn't take an entire uh, two hours on evidence in chief and cross-examination and re-examination. You'll get to that part. So I was just uh, touching on the basics, right? So, okay, there's a, an important question there that says you need to put a, a, your client's statement that he's gonna come and tell the court to this witness that you are cross-examining. Why do you need to do that? To put the client's version to the witnesses because you have to get a reaction to from them while they are on the stand. Because if you don't do that, the court will later, when you now get to the defense case, and the accused is coming with this very crucial information that was not informed to the state witnesses that now the court will say, ah, but the state witnesses were here. Why was this information not given to them so that we could get their reaction to that, to that particular, you know, version of events? So ensure that you put the accused version to the witnesses so that they can say, he's lying, he's lying, he's the one who attacked me. But in any event, you would have said to them, the accused is going to come later on and tell this court that he's not the one who actually robbed you. You are making a mistake, ma'am. 
and they will say he's lying, he's lying. He's fine. You move on. You've you've placed it so that the accused, when he comes later on and he says, yes, I'm not the one. It's not new. It's not something that has not been heard by the court before. So then, obviously, after re uh, cross examination, the state will also get an opportunity to re examine. Now, I touch also on what is called a surprise witness. It's a, one of the sometimes uh, uh, cases that happens in court where the, the defense will be <clears throat> surprised that the state is saying they have this witness who has never made a statement and they want to call them to testify. You as the defense, you should object to such a witness being called because that is tantamount to a trial by ambush. Please note that some presiding officers will order that the prosecutor will go and sit with the defense and the accused and consult with this witness in order for you to have this witness to come and testify. Now, you challenge this, and I'll tell you why. Remember I said, when a witness testifies, first of all, you would have and ordinarily have their statement that they made to the police, which you would have used to prepare for this trial. So you didn't have that for this witness. Now, if you allow this presiding officer to press you and sit with a prosecutor and consult with this witness, and they, you say, okay, it's fine. I know what this witness is coming to tell the court. That witness can say things that are very damaging to your case or to the accused case. And how would you now be able to show inconsistencies if there were, would have been any, if they had made a statement to the police earlier? The reason why witnesses make statements to the police is to show consistency in their statements. So if there is no earlier statement that has been written down, you, how, what do you challenge that with? So it's reckless of you to allow that. That's the point I'm making. Re-examination, that's when now the state will do all the defense after a witness has testified and been cross-examined, will now have an opportunity to do damage control. You ask questions emanating out of cross-examination. Where there is new evidence that is introduced, you inform the court that no, this should not be allowed because that did not come out of cross-examination. You interrupt. Sometimes you find a situation that you were not the attorney who started the trial, or you were the attorney who started the trial for a very good reason. There's information that was not informed to the state witnesses or the defense witness. There is a, an opportunity that the court can allow a witness who already testified to come back to testify further. So defense, you should know when to raise a valid objection to the recalling of such a witness. And remember we said when you object, you object with reasons. The court in allowing this witness to testify, they will have to find that it is in the interest of justice <laughs> to allow the testimony of this witness. And also check, whether there will not be any prejudice that is suffered by the accused or the state witnesses when this person is, 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 is recalled and this may possibly end up with the trial being rendered unfair. So the court can also call for further evidence of what the court itself may call a court witness. defense. Be careful that this should not be an opportunity to close gaps for the state 
where they have failed to do a proper job. Okay, before I close on these questions and witnesses, when a witness testifies, in evidence in chief, cross-examination, re-examinations are done. This is where we are now. The court can also ask its own questions uh, to the witness. What kind of questions is the court allowed or it's acceptable, not allowed. It's acceptable of the court to ask. These are questions from the bench. Questions. Yeah. When the court is asking questions, it cannot re-examine a witness. It cannot uh, ask questions that are closing gaps where the state has failed and, le and left loopholes, you know, the questions that are allowed and acceptable of the court to ask are only one type of questions. They are clarity-seeking questions. Be careful of that weight. Because even you will often find that the, the presiding officer will say, eh, this is a clarity-seeking question, ma'am. But you can hear that it's now bordering on cross-examining the witness. Or it's introducing information that is new and it's damaging. What do you do? You jump. Remember the proceedings are being recorded. You mention this to the court and say, pardon me, your worship, but this question that this court is asking it's actually now cross-examining the witness. It's not a clarity-seeking question. Be confident, be firm. With all due respect, this question, it's not a clarity-seeking question, and you will say why you say it's not. Remember, the state had their, their time to allow the witness to tell the court in your own words what happened to you. The whole gory stories was put on the record. So why would the court come and elicit something that was supposed to have been elicited by the state prosecutor or something that should have been, you know? So it must be clarity where it looks unclear. So like, ma'am, you mentioned that uh, you were standing at a distance of four meters, but also later on, you mentioned that something about being at eight meters distance. So. Exactly, can you clarify, was it four meters or eight meters? That's clarity seeking, it's fine. You can, you, can, you can hear that this person just wants to be sure whether it was eight or four, but also be very, very sharp, sharp on that. So yeah, be on guard, be, have your ears open. Don't sit back now and you take your pen on the side and you fold your hands and you say, now is the time for the court to ask questions. It's okay, it's the court. What injustice can happen? It's the court. Don't allow that. You note each and every word that is coming out of the, way, the mouth of that presiding officer. And you analyze it as they are talking, whether this is, is going to be a problem because those are the gaps because Inexperience is not only on the part of defense lawyers. Inexperience also happens on the part of state prosecutors. So remember, if you don't guard against that, the court, depending on who they are, not everyone uh, who is a presiding officer came from the side of defense lawyers. Some prosecutors were, I mean, some presiding officers were uh, prosecutors. Like now, for instance, ladies and gentlemen, imagine LC as a presiding officer. Although, yes, when you become a presiding officer, there is a training, a debriefing, and everything that tries to make you to forget who you have been all your professional life, to now acclimatize you to this new setup of being a presiding officer. You are a human being. You've heard me, I even confess it, that I try to tell you both sides of the coin from the state and the defense, but I'm sure you've heard me clear that this is a defense lawyer who is talking here. Now you can also know, my, my, I'm wired in that way. 
you understand that when I question things, I question from a defense point of view. You understand? Because that is what I know. The lawyer. That is, I beat my chest. <laughs> I beat my chest about it. I'm proud of that. That is who I am. You understand? So it's something, it's in my nature. It's in my everything. So yes, this honest and, 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 and you know, whatever you want to say, the beautiful words about our presiding officer. It depends of which side they came from. Because all of them either came from the defense or they came from the state. And, you know, the wiring that's where you get these terms that we hear that, no, that one, he's a nice magistrate, but they will also say, oh, that one, he's a convictionist. Why? Because of their, you know, thing that they were used to seek a conviction in their line of work. You understand? So it's not that they are right by doing that because they're only human. Yes, you show them that, mm -mm, your worship, Please, now you are stepping on an, an, an area of the state now. It's the state who should have asked that question. Please, yours is clarity seeking. Please. And when you do that now, you are unsettling them because they wouldn't want to be seen to be biased, right? And to be favoring and, you know, and, pro and, and possibly, uh, you know, get this whole trial to be rendered unfair. So they will step back and be like, okay. Let me rephrase, uh, ma'am, clarify to this court that uh, now you can see that they are applying their mind properly and thinking clearly to just clearly, clearly get clarity. <laughs> this clarity seeking, guys, it's a monster. Yeah, that's all I can just tell you. So please, 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 please be careful of that thing. Thank you. That's all I have to say on that. <laughs> Do you have questions? I want to move. Okay, fine. So, seven one four uh, section one seven four. It's one of the things that get uh, happen. They happen at the state where the the state case is completed. The state has actually pronounced that the state case is closed which means they have called all their witnesses, produced all the evidence that they wanted, and they are done. And you make your assessment now as the defense lawyer. In terms of this section 174, there is a test that you apply to check whether the state has now made what is called a prima facie case. That is a case that is on face value, something that is probable, that can lead to a possible conviction, should it go to the end uh, of uh, the trial. So you, on this part, we are dealing with the material contradictions. If there were material contradictions that came up in the testimonies of the witnesses, mm -hmm. any improbabilities that you picked up by the state witnesses that, that shows that the witness's evidence was of such a poor quality that it would be difficult for a reasonable court to convict based on that evidence. So where the gaps were left open by the state witnesses, it cannot be the responsibility of the accused to come and close those gaps. So please, you jump up, you bring that application for the discharge of the accused. You want to read more about Section 174. It's fully detailed in your manuals, ladies and gentlemen. Case laws, I think it's state versus Lubata. I think it's a very popular one that gives a nice test how you want to apply it and see. But in instances where you apply for this uh, uh, discharge, there are times when you will be so confident, but the court will not agree to grant this discharge especially where there is more than one accused involved in the case. And this is usually for the fear that if they release accused number two and the case proceeds now for accused number one to the defense case, accused number one, and it's been something that has been proven, they come and they blame everything on accused number two who was discharged. So, there is that uh, likelihood that you will bring this application and they will hold on to both accused, even if you were so sure 
that really I'm, I'm good here, I'm strong, my case should be a discharge, and you will only get your, your acquittal at the end of the defense case. Okay. I see that we are left with five minutes. So the same process with a defense case, ladies and gentlemen, for what I've just been preaching on is exactly the same as I've said. Evidence in chief, cross-examination, everything in this defense case happens in the same fashion. And I've also spoken to you about our ethics in terms of ensuring that you take instructions from your client. You don't give them a version because they get caught up. They will now say you told them to say it. So you also don't influence your defense witnesses on what they should say. There's also cautionary rules that are rules of practice that are going to be applied, but they're not in terms of any legislation. This is where, for instance, you will ask the court to take uh, the, the evidence that came from a child to treat it with caution or a single witness because there's no corroboration of that testimony or where there's complainants in sexual offenses or accomplices. Those type of witnesses, when they give evidence, great caution is applied to their witnesses, uh, to their evidence. So the aim is to ensure that we avoid wrong convictions. And yeah, because of suggestion to children, you know, they can be easily influenced. Single witness, you know, I've said corroboration. Complainants with sexual offenses, you would have to check the motive. And accomplice, you could have to check also someone who's a 204 witness. Maybe they just want to get scot free. You know, so you check on them. So it's therefore important with those type of evidence to get corroboration from other witnesses. So cases of identity, we've discussed a lot about that as well. That is enough. It's not enough for the these witnesses to just be honest when they are giving testimony. We we scrutinize, we 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 dismantle their with their evidence. We turn it upside down. And S versus Muteto is there. Children, I've told you, they are impressionable. They are easily sus uh, sus susceptible to suggestions, so they can be easily influenced. So the use of technology is also another type of evidence that is commonly used, like videos. We know that uh, photographs can be manipulated with what they call a Photoshop. So we challenge the authenticity of such evidence, right? And experts, if you call for an expert, whether it's the state or it's the defense, we have to uh, ensure that you will qualify this person to be considered an expert before the court, because not everyone who speaks should be considered. We must question their educational background. We will question their experience on what they do on a daily basis and the specific focus. So who is that now? We are done, guys, please, please. Who is that who's who's just singing for us now? Please, mute. Hello, Mike. Sorry, I was reminded of a case of Sergio. About the about the uh, what what's called the evidence base of of the uh, experts. That case yeah. it was the the police was not qualified enough to give an evidence. Yeah, so the, you must be an expert, qualified to speak on that with authority, and you must have all that backup on record to show that we can consider you an expert. So the last one here, ladies and gentlemen, it's. My second last slide on sentence, which is dealing with the factors that the court will consider when it con it's going to consider the suitable sentence. And also you check that the, as those offenses that I said, they carry a minimum sentence, which will guide the court on how to sentence. And please note that drunkenness is not a mitigating factor. Who is this now? Guys, please call out this person, please. Who's just putting their radio on? Thank you. Drunkenness is not a mitigating factor all the time. Watch out that there's actually a specific criminal offense where someone goes and drinks alcohol to gather the guts to go and confront and commit an, a criminal offense. 
that can actually work as intoxication can be a, I mean, drunkenness can be an aggravating factor. So yes, the level of intoxication, it's not going to be a defense, but it can uh, be an aggravating factor to show that you took alcohol for the sole purpose of gathering is being the, 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 the liver to go and commit this offense because you were you were chicken. Now you, you felt that if I, I strengthen my, my liver, I, I'm going to do it. That is a very bad thing. Yeah. So before passing of sentence, the court should balance interest of society, the nature and the seriousness of the offense, and the personal circumstances of the accused. You can appeal, ladies and gentlemen, section 309 is there. Please read it. It will lead you nicely on the process, but you generally have 14 days after both conviction and sentence to file your appeal, and you are limited to the record, which is evidence that was produced in the trial, and no new evidence can be introduced, and you proceed with your limited grounds of appeal. I've spoken already about reviews. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Ta-da! <laughs> so, yeah, so we made it, uh, yeah, just a minute extra. I really Thank do you. hope that uh, really I tried my best to accommodate all your questions. I don't think you still have anything because really we have a whole full rich five days to deal with this. I know the subject of criminal court practice is so broad and there's so many aspects that we could have uh, you know, dealt with at an extensive level, but I know you are going to be great at this field. So please, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you well with all your studies and I'm waiting and, and I cannot wait yeah, to meet uh, some of you when you will come by and say, Elsie, I was in your class and I see you uh, doing the do, you know? Yeah, making us proud for what we have imparted on you. And yeah, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. How can thank we you. Oh, we go to uh, thank you very thank much? You. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The recording now will not to access. Get, you, you'll get the, the, the recordings and you can thank speak you. to me. Yeah. Thank, thank you. 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 Good night. Good luck. We have, so many, things, we have so many things being added on this e-leader. E e this is going to be a bit confusing. Thank you, Elsie. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Hello, guys. Is anybody there? Bye, to Zubiswa. Bye, Zubiswa. Is anybody there to answer? Guys, did the person who was responsible to form a WhatsApp group, did they mm. form it or what? They did. My name is not there. Can you please add me on? Uh, uh Okay, the chat is, is still it? available. I can ask the admin to add you because I am part of that group. Can you take oh, my please. number down, please? I have yes, been I adding zero eight two. I thought you would like. Right. <laughs> oh, but I put it on a chat. Yes, I'm still in. Okay, oh, oh, eight eight. Two, three, oh, eight two three four nine. There it is. Zero eight two okay. three zero eight. Okay. Can you see it now? <clears throat> yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Can you please also add me to the group? I'll write my number on the chat. Add me to the group. I am going to request that admin to add you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's the name of the group? CCP? I did ask last night to just place your numbers again. The network is high wire. 
So you just post your numbers again and I'll do my best to get all of you added. We've made please, please. please do that. Help us. <laughs> please do that. Help <laughs> us, please. Hello. Guys, there's a question I want to ask here. Are you are you guys listening? Seems like yes, everybody. Listening. Yeah, we're still here, boss. Kick. We're yes. listening. Uh, there's this this thing of adding so many things on the e leader. I don't know. This is getting me confused. You know, kind of like not getting a hold of what to do again and with what to read. Uh, some of the uh, models that are being added there, they say they're not credited and all this kind of a thing. Then you get confused as to what what exactly are we going to be doing here? You know. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, you'll find that one module has like two codes, you know? Mm. So I I don't know. Yeah, well, what, what I did what I did from my side, I called the principal uh with the list of uh when you open on a test quiz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you open a test quiz um tab. Can I show you if you don't mind? Yeah. Okay, let me do this. Let me make sure I'm opening the correct page. Oh, it says I can't, I cannot share. It says only meeting organizer and presenters can share but uh, if oh. you go to our main landing page on lead mm. don't you want to go there uh, yeah go ahead. And log in mm. after you've logged in you will see a tab that's uh, the name of the tab is uh doo -doo 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 -doo. oh this looks like it has changed Yeah, LSSA UNISA 2021. Like for Can instance, you if you go to if you go no, to no, site. No, no, no. Yeah, the LSSA UNISA 2023. Why mine says now 2021? Yeah, okay. I think you should go down one. Awesome. Uh, the, 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 no, 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 the one awesome. is the one is the what do you call it? Let me log um, in again. It's the intake. Scroll <laughs> down to the end of the landing page. Yeah. Scroll down. Sometimes you find it at the bottom, at the far end. Is it not there? Yeah, I can see them. Can you see it? Yeah. If you if you go down to LSA. Because I'm going to say now, what is showing me is an announcement. If you are seeing announcement, just check uh, test and quiz. And quizzes, or something quiz. like that. Yeah, but then when you, when, when you click them, then you will see the, the, the assessment. That's what we are supposed to do. Does, does your tab say 2023 in all of them? Yes. Yeah, but yes. you know, to get it at the bottom. Guys, I kind of like, I kind of like. This is a bit confusing like, uh, because some of my chats are saying 2021. Okay, I'm seeing. Uh, no, I, no I, we I must do the one of 2023. I do have those in 2021 as well. Yeah, I, I have 2021 as well. But go to the bottom of the landing page. I need to print screen it. this. Eh? And sent to the principal. The only assessments that are submitted for grading is the ones that is listed under your LSSA UNISA online 2023 tab. And then you go down to test and quizzes. Then all of our 18 modules are listed there. You'll see it says 2023 
dash one and then the abbreviation of the module. Yeah, so my system my system has changed. It's no longer having that. It's having that as 2021 instead of 2023. Oh, goodness. And if you click on <laughs> test and service, I've what does it say? I've got to test and quiz. Mm. I'm seeing all these things now. The ones that are written one hour, one hour, tattoo. What two is, and all the rest. What's the due date on the side? Is it 2nd of July? Or fourth of July. July. Yes. You, you mean on which for for uh, criminal court procedure? It's on the second of July, right? Yes, that's correct. So those ones are the ones that are submitted for grading. But if you look on the landing page, all the other um, tabs on the top, those oh. are the ones that's just for self assessment purposes. Um, I think there was an announcement by the principal also. Um, if I can just interrupt quickly. If you guys sure. listen on the landing screen, at the top right hand corner, right next to your, where you supposedly put your profile picture, there's a block with nine little squares in it. Yeah, let's go down to one. Just click on mm. that square. Because the site is engineered in such a fashion that it will only reflect the first, team, the first 15 modules that it recognizes as your favorite. So if you just click on that little block, it's going to throw you the, the complete list of all the modules. If you can see the Nisa online, the tags that the guys are complaining they're missing, everything is there. And if not, then you guys must contact the Tisva. Because then you have to be added onto that module. So what about this one, the right project? Projects. What's that one? I'm not talking about the project. For now, my main concern was just getting all the assessments, the assessments that they will be grading us on, the assessments that we need to complete to get certification for our PVC. Yeah. On that side, you can see all your models, and it's going to be slightly a bit more work. But from there, you can go into every site and every model that you have, and you can determine what assessments is are due when, and whether they are standalone or whether they are required for certification. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Is the office open tomorrow? <laughs> so much. Sorry, does anyone know with the uh, three assignments for the criminal court uh, procedure where we have to log those assignments on under which which tab? I also have seen the assessment, but I also haven't been able to determine where exactly that that I suppose that they will add, like they did in the week in the last couple of days, they will add additional sites as we go along. It's still early. So I think they will add the option of submission as we go along. Okay, okay, sure. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Enjoy your weekend. Bye. 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 Bye, guys. Bye. Good night. <laughs>